This episode is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. It seems like in these crazy and unprecedented times, there are a few options to relax and unwind after a long day. Sometimes just watching a video or scrolling through social media doesn't cut it, you know what I mean? In these monotonous times, I need something that makes me feel alive. Something that feels, dare I say, dangerous? That's where Hunt a Killer comes in. Hunt a Killer is a monthly subscription box that brings all of the mystery and intrigue of true crime back home. Made up of authentic looking and complex clues, Hunt a Killer allows you to solve a deadly and layered mystery over a series of boxes delivered right to your door. And for those who watch our channel in the sincere hope that victims and their families might soon see some closure, I think you will find this next bit of information as important as I did. Part of the proceeds of every Hunt a Killer box goes to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization that is dedicated to helping investigate real-life cold cases. For a little risk-taking from the safety of your own home, see if you can hunt a killer. Visit huntakiller.com slash Merck and use code Merck for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use the promo code Merck for a 20% discount. Judith Bellow was a 28-year-old woman who lived with her husband and her three-year-old son on Saratoga Drive in Stanwood, Washington. On December 13, 1993, Judith dropped her son off at daycare and then drove to her job at National Food Corporation in Sylvania. At around 9.30 a.m., she vanished from her job. She did not return back to her home and she did not pick her son up from daycare. A massive search was carried out. Her car was later found abandoned at the Stanwood Post Office, but there was no sign of Judith. Judith was close with her family, and they said it seemed very unlikely that she would leave her three-year-old son behind. Eventually, her profile was featured on Eight of Hearts in the country's deck of cold case playing cards. The police distributed the playing cards to inmates in local jails and state prisons, hoping to find any leads in the case. Three months after she went missing, Judith's husband and their son moved away and lost contact with the family. Then, on November 23, 2011, almost two decades later, a woman claiming to be Judith Bellow called the police to inform them that she was alive and well. She said that she called the police after she saw her profile on the website. Through multiple interviews with the woman and the family, police confirmed that the woman indeed was Judith Bellow. It was found that Judith had left of her own accord because of marital problems, and she said that she did not reach out to her family because she was scared of her husband and feared he would cause problems for her siblings. She was now living in California and had a new family with three children. Judith said she didn't realize she was listed as a missing person until she looked up her name online. The family would be reunited after 18 years. Aldana Orozco was a 14-year-old girl in 2011, living with her mother and stepfather in Mendoza, Argentina. Her mother, Monica Matarano, worked in a nursing home, and her stepfather worked for the city. Aldana studied at Marcelino Blanco Secondary School. On July 8, 2011, she would disappear from her home. Neighbors said the police did not start their investigation into her disappearance until two months had passed. Friends and family organized marches, demanding the police help find her. Shortly after Aldana went missing, a rumor started to circulate that she had traveled to San Luis with a boyfriend. The San Luis police investigated the rumor, but came up empty-handed. Aldana would remain missing for the next 10 years, until, in December of 2020, Aldana would be found in Buenos Aires. She had been a victim of human trafficking and had been forced into prostitution. She is now 24 years old and has two children. On December 30th, 2020, police raided her parents' home located in the commune of La Paz. Aldana's mother and stepfather were arrested on suspicion of selling their daughter to a prostitution ring. Her mother, Monica Matarano, was sent to a woman's prison in Borboyan, while her stepfather, Alberto Orozco, was taken to the Bologna sur Mer prison. Aldana is currently in Buenos Aires, being treated by a medical team who is evaluating her state of health. The case is still under investigation. Edgar Latulip was a 21-year-old from Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. 
Edgar was mentally disabled and had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old. He was also depressed, and in 1986, he tried to commit suicide. He was admitted to a hospital and had been staying at a group home in Kitchener. On September 2, 1986, he boarded a bus from Kitchener to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls was about 90 minutes away from Kitchener. He did not arrive back home and was reported missing. He wasn't carrying any luggage with him and police assumed that he traveled to Niagara Falls to kill himself. Edgar's mother and police searched for him for years, distributing flyers and age progression photos. He would remain missing for three decades. Then, in 2016, police got a call from a social worker in St. Catharines, Ontario, that a man had identified himself to be Edgar Latulip. Edgar had been living under a new name in a new city. It was found that Edgar had hit his head in 1986, causing him to lose his memory. A few months before being discovered, he started to have flashbacks of his old life and remembered that his name was Edgar Latulip. He then went to a social worker to tell her that he had remembered his old name and remembered his old life. The social worker googled the name and found out that a man named Edgar Latulip had gone missing 30 years earlier. A DNA test confirmed that he indeed was the missing Edgar Latulip. He was reunited with his family after over 30 years. Alex Cooper was a successful salesman, businessman, and family man in his mid-60s. He had a loving wife, five children, and several grandchildren. On April 4th, 1987, Alex's daughter and her husband were driving across a bridge when they noticed Alex's car parked at the side of the road. They decided to stop and check up on him. After not finding him in the car, they made their way back to the riverbank as they thought he might be fishing near the river. However, after reaching the riverbank, they couldn't find him anywhere. His daughter became worried as Alex had a heart condition. She immediately called her mother, Margaret, who told her that she hadn't seen Alex in over 24 hours. The family then reported him missing. Police searched his vehicle but did not find anything out of the ordinary. His clothes and fishing equipment were inside of the car. An extensive search for him was carried out. The police learned that Alex had eaten at a restaurant less than a mile from where his car was found. Margaret said that Alex used to carry rolls of cash and always paid in cash. She feared that someone could have seen the large amount of money he had with him and robbed and killed him. While her daughter feared that he had had a heart attack, fell and drowned in the river. Soon, witnesses came forward and reported to have seen a man resembling Alex hitchhiking in the area near where his car was found. Police suspected he may have left of his own volition. However, his family did not believe this as he had left his credit card and his heart medication at home. A year later, when Alex could not be found, he was declared legally dead. Later, Margaret tried to find Alex's birth certificate, but she could not find it anywhere. She checked the records and found that there wasn't any birth certificate issued in Alex's name. Moreover, there was no record of his existence before their marriage in 1952. The family realized Alex Cooper was not his real name and that he had hidden his past from them all these years. Alex remained missing for the next four years. Then, on May 27, 1991, a man was reported missing in Toronto. The man was named David Cooper, and he resembled Alex Cooper. David was reported missing by his friend, after not being able to find him during a business trip. Police searched David's apartment and found a photograph of Alex Cooper holding his grandchild in his room. This confirmed that David and Alex were in fact the same man. David slash Alex would return two days later and found evidence of police being in his home. He asked his landlady, who told him that police had come looking for him after he was reported missing. Alex would leave again and would remain missing for almost another year. He was featured on Unsolved Mysteries TV show and a viewer living in Hamilton, Canada recognized Alex and contacted the police. In January of 1992, Alex was located and he finally told the truth about his past life. 
He said that as a young adult, he was falsely accused of robbery. As he did not want to go to jail for a crime that he didn't commit, he changed his name to Alex Cooper and went on the run. He married Margaret four years later and lived as Alex Cooper for 30 years until his 65th birthday when he was asked to produce a birth certificate to receive pension. As he did not have one and he couldn't bear to tell his family the truth about his past, he decided to vanish. He was reunited with his family, who accepted him back. 